Okay, we are live now and it's uh, being recorded. So if you have anything to uh, say, uh, just let me know and we'll get that in as well. I'm starting on installment land contracts, right? Is that where everybody is in their notes? Okay, let me remind you why this is important and then we'll talk about a couple of different ways that these questions uh, come up. Installment land contract is right at the end of chapter 10. And basically what the commission is telling you is we don't have a contract form for this. We don't have a standardized form for this. So basically the first important point is the bullet point that I have there. Since we don't have one, if you need one, please go to an attorney and have one drafted. We're not going to test you on the specificity of this. Um, there was a state law that changed back, I think in 2012 that made these much more punitive on uh, sellers and much more informative to buyers, assuming that people actually followed the law. I don't know how many there are people there are that know the law exists, but the commission said, don't get bogged down in that. Go to an attorney and tell the buyers and sellers they need to discuss with the attorneys the good and bad of an installment land contract. So what are the things I want you to know that you might be tested on in regards to the installment land contract? Well, keep in mind, here's the first thing. An installment land contract is a type of seller financing. It's a type of seller financing. In this type of seller financing, the seller holds the title in his name until he is paid off. So in other words, it looks kind of like uh, this, Charles. Charles, yeah, I will be glad to finance this property for you. However, here's what's going to happen. We're going to keep the deed in my name until you pay me off. If you pay me off over three years, seven years, 15 years, fine. At that point, I'll give you the deed. Okay? Now, a couple of things. When we talk about advantages and disadvantages to the parties on this. Well, the advantage to the buyer is simply they don't have to deal with the bank. Okay, so they, they, they're dealing directly with the uh, seller. To the seller, it may open up a whole pool of people who could not buy the property if they had to go to the bank. So that's one thing good for the seller. The other thing good for the uh, seller is they're still holding title to the property. So it's easy for them to get rid of the buyer if necessary. The disadvantages to the buyer is the buyer doesn't hold legal title to the property they do have and this is actually an interesting word what the buyer has is equitable title and equitable title anytime you see that just always assume that that means as long as you perform according to the contract you will eventually get legal title but the buyer just has equitable title if he tried to sell the property someone might be suspicious of his rights to do that he would have a right to sell it though. the disadvantage to the seller is that there is someone on the property that has an interest in the uh, property. So if, they, if the seller tried to do something uh, with it or if the buyer quit paying them, they'd have to deal with getting them off of the uh, property, okay? Advantages and disadvantages, keep it fairly straightforward. I do like this bullet point right here though. The, the um, installment land contract, by the way, th this is probably the most important thing I'm gonna say about installment land contract. Don't forget it's also referred to as a contract for deed. Uh, I don't know if you remember the story I told you in class, but one of my students came back and said, what's this thing called a contract for deed? And I said, it was an installment contract. And he said, oh, well, if I'd known that, I would have gotten the question right on the exam. He just didn't recognize the other vernacular that it's I went by. So a contract for deed or an installment land contract, it is a sales agreement because the seller is actually selling the property to the buyer. But do you understand that it has to be a financing agreement too? Charles would never buy a property from me if I'm financing it for him, if I didn't tell him what the terms were. Otherwise, he'd just be paying me forever. So it has to be not only a sales agreement and a financing uh, agreement. And notice this next bullet point. Since I'm conveying real property, don't forget the statute of frauds. Contracts to convey an interest in real property must be in writing to be enforceable. So should an installment contract be in writing? Yeah. If it involves the conveyance of real property, yeah, it needs to be in writing according to the statute of frauds. And if it needs to be in writing under the statute of frauds, it needs to be recorded under the contract. Some of that legislation I was talking about in 2012 now requires sellers who uh, sell property this way to record the document within, I think, three days. It's not important for test purposes on that. Okay. Still at the end of chapter 10, and uh, we're gonna talk about option to purchase. Why? Well, here comes the repetitive part of it. It's another contract, standard form for it. So the commission is saying, go talk to an attorney if you need an option to purchase. The option to purchase, there are two things that I think are interesting in regards to the option to purchase. One of them is this bullet point right here. Uh, it's an example of a unilateral contract. Why is it a unilateral contract? 
in an option contract, what has happened is the buyer has purchased time to determine whether they're going to complete the transaction. So what I did is I gave Charles some money up front and I said, Hey, Charles, hold this property for me. Hold this, hold this offer open for me while I make my mind up whether I'm going to buy the property or not. And you say, well, why would Charles do that? Well, the reason he did that is I gave him some money. I gave him an option fee to hold the property. What did I get for my option fee? I got time to determine whether I was going to complete the uh, transaction. Okay. If it sounds a lot like due diligence, it, it is. I mean, due diligence and option are very similar. Technically, in a due diligence contract, I'm buying the right to terminate, whereas in an option contract, I'm buying the right to buy. Okay. Uh, Patty, I'm going to come back to you there. It looks like you had your uh, hand up. But there's no, there's no um, certain amount where option fee, there's no certain amount, set amount for him to hold it. Or is that, that's up to the completely seller. Negotiable. Well, up to the buyer and the seller. It's uh, completely negotiable. Yeah. But, uh, and that's why Charles would have to, you know, have to weigh it. Well, how, how long am I going to take my property off the market and what amount of money would um, satisfy me? And on the buyer side, I need to, just like due diligence, I need to make my mind up at the end of the option period to determine whether I'm going to exercise my option to buy the property. Now, Patty. So it's the same, same thing as time is of the essence here as well? Yes. Matter of fact, that's a great point. All option contracts are time is of the essence, okay. meaning that you have to make a decision by a certain time. Closely okay. tied to that, all option contracts are well-defined terms. We define the fee, we define the time period, and we define the amount that I'm going to be able to purchase the property for. So in other words, when I gave Charles the money, basically I said, Charles, you're going to have to sell this property to me for, I'm making this number up, $200,000 if I exercise my option. Okay, well-defined terms, well-defined time period, option amount and the uh, purchase price. Okay. Why, is it why is it unilateral? During the term of the option, if the buyer says sell, the seller has to sell. But during the term of the option, if the seller says, hey buyer, I need the money, go ahead and complete the transaction, the buyer says, well, I'll take it or leave it. And then the, the seller is limited to just having the option money that he's uh, collected if that's the uh, case. Uh, by the way, the option fee, it may or may not be credited if the buyer decides to buy. What I mean by that is it depends on what the contract says. If the contract says, hey, Charles, that $1,000 I gave you is going to be credited at closing, then it will be. If it doesn't, I'm not going to be credited that money at closing. And the reason for that is simply because I got what I paid for. I got the time period whether I chose to exercise my option or, or well not. can the buyer put say can the buyer says he wants that in the contract to have it go towards can they yeah. do that okay. yeah absolutely again all subject to negotiations but most option contracts will have that in there but if they okay. do not he doesn't automatically get credit for it okay uh -huh. so what do I want you to remember about option just go to an attorney and have one uh, drafted um, the option fee, the option period, and the purchase price are all going to be well-defined terms. And option contracts are always time is of the essence. Okay. If you got those three or four bullet points out of there, you did good. And then finally, on tests, sometimes they compare the option to this. I don't tend to think that they're very similar, but I, I understand why they uh, do it. So the thing I'm going to talk about now is a right of first refusal. We actually refer to them as preemptive rights. And basically what this does is it gives you a right in the upper. Matter of fact, I literally had one of these come up yesterday. It was kind of uh, interesting. Um, a right of first refusal works like this. It's a contract where there is some buyer out there who has a right to purchase the property if it ever goes on the market. So basically what, happen the, what happens in the uh, right of first refusal is if you have a right of first refusal in my property, I never have to sell it. But if I do, I have to give you the first shot at it. If I do decide to sell it and I give you the first shot, you don't have to buy it, but you have the right to do so. The one that I had come to my attention yesterday was kind of interesting. It was a buyer who had purchased a house from Habitat for Humanity. And I never thought about this because they got a special deal with Habitat for Humanity. They actually have a contract that says 
now that they own the house, if they ever want to sell the house, they have to give Habitat the first chance to buy it, okay? So what happened in this case is the buyer puts it on the market. This house has gone way up in value because the area has grown. It's somewhere around the Chapel Hill area. And so Habitat looks at it and says, well, their goal, of course, is to keep low-income housing. So the, the another buyer out there who wants to buy this house, but the seller has to give uh, Habitat the first opportunity to buy this uh, house before they can sell it to anybody else. So it's interesting that these, occasionally they do come up. Now, the reason I think that for test purposes, this is easy to recognize uh, the difference between this and an option. In a right of first refusal, first of all, the seller never has to sell. If the seller does sell, the buyer doesn't have to buy. And if the seller decides to sell and the buyer doesn't, um, if the seller does decide to sell and the buyer does decide to buy, we don't yet know what the price is going to be. The way most rights of first refusal work is that if in fact uh, you decide to sell the property, give me the right to match your highest offer. That's the way most of them work. Okay. I think that's enough on that. Again, let me remind you, the end of chapter 10 is all about there are these other contracts that exist. We just don't have them. So go to an attorney and get them. Then we get into landlord and uh, tenant. This could be actually good for somewhere between six and eight points because landlord and tenant uh, could go national or it could go state. Uh, landlord tenant also could include some property management. So there's a lot of stuff that you can really get your teeth into on a landlord tenant. I don't actually find the questions to be that hard. I do find them to be specific though. So we'll be real careful about uh, this. So when we talk about landlord and uh, tenant, we talk about the rights of the party. In North Carolina, we have what we call the Residential Rental Agreements Act. It is what it sounds like. Uh, however, if on the state, on the national exam, you may see something referred to as a Uniform um, Rental Agreements Act or something to that effect. If you ever see something called a Uniform Act, what it means that it's a standardized, uh, uh, it's a standardized act that is gonna be very, very similar throughout the country. In other words, what North Carolina does is we take the Uniform Act and then we add some specific language to it. So they tend to be very, very close. I don't think that you have to make distinction on the national exam between things that we learned in this class. Okay, so we talk about the rights and duties of the landlord. At this point, I would encourage you to be as uh, succinct and logical as possible. The rights and duties of the landlord fit and habitable premises provide a fit and habitable premises, okay? Um, there's a lot of things that flow from that. If something breaks, you need to fix it if it's a safety uh, condition or if it's a system that you had uh, provided. Um, don't be a slumlord. I mean, this all this kind of falls under that. Uh, make sure you comply with the building code. That would fall under that category as well. Then we talk about rights and duties of the tenant. These are very, very simple as well. Uh, pay your rent when it's uh, due. Don't tear the place up. It's fairly basic what the rights and duties of the uh, tenants are, okay? So basically what I just described to you were the duties of the parties. Now, when we go to the rights of the parties, I'm gonna use this language down here below. And actually part of what you're gonna to need to remember is whose right is this, get it in the correct category. So when we talk about constructive eviction, now notice what my definition there, the constructive eviction is the tenant's right in the event of a breach by the landlord, okay? Charles, you are nodding along with me here, so I'm gonna get you back on uh, for just a minute. Okay, I've just told you that constructive eviction is the tenant's right based on the breach by the landlord. We always talk about the tenant breaching, but tell me, Charles, based on what we just said, how could the landlord breach the contract, the lease agreement? How could a landlord breach? Uh, he could breach the contract by um, actually well, by let's, not evicting. Um, well, let's not go there for just a second. I don't want to blur those lines a little bit, but I'm going to give you a, a softball here to get you uh, going. The, um, the landlord was required to provide a fit and habitable premises. Yes, that's right. So what's one way, so what's one way that the landlord could breach? is if uh, the landlord, for example, isn't performing maintenance on the property. Okay. 
There you go. And especially things like, um, let's talk about air conditioning and heat, for example. Okay. Mm -hmm. So your heater is not working and it's February and it's cold. Yep. Yes. Does that sound like something that the landlord would be obligated to do? Absolutely. Okay. All right. So the reason I, I point that one out to you is you, I mean, you're really getting into health and safety and stuff like that. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here's the deal. You Charles are a tenant. You made a bona fide request. I need my heat fixed. It's not working and it's 12 degrees outside. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is a bona fide request. Yes. Now, if the landlord does not fix it, they are in breach of their obligation as a uh, landlord, right? Yes. Okay. Now here's where the test question starts getting a little bit tricky. Here's where it starts getting specific and tricky. As the tenant, you're tired of waiting for the landlord to fix this. So Charles, can you do this? Can you go out and get someone to repair your heating system and then withhold that amount of money from the rent? No, you cannot. No, you cannot uh, do that. Can you do this, Charles? Can you call up the landlord and say, I'm not paying you rent until you fix this heating system. Can you do no, that? You nope, you cannot uh, do that. Charles, here's what the tenant can do. And by the way, remember, this is a test question. In real mm -hmm. life, you know, we, we might need to give people other advice. But having said that, here's the test question for you. Here's what the tenant can do. You made a reasonable request, heat needs to be fixed. You waited a reasonable period of time. We're not going to define what a reasonable period of time is because that would depend on the circumstances. If it's mm -hmm. heat and it's February and it's 12 degrees, reasonable period of time will be relatively short. So yes. Charles made a reasonable request, waited a reasonable period of time, and if the landlord doesn't fix it, Here's what Charles can do. He can move out and then he can stop paying rent. Do y'all remember that from class? Notice the order. He made the re reasonable request, wait a reasonable period of time, landlord did nothing, tenant moved out, then stop paying uh, rent. That is constructive eviction. The landlord has constructively uh, evicted the tenant because he didn't fix anything. Now, Charles, okay, get one more tough question. I'll let you off the hook here. Charles, if you the tenant, let's assume you have a bona fide case, okay? Mm -hmm. If you have a bona fide case for uh, constructive eviction and you move out six months into a 12-month lease, do you get your security deposit back? Hmm. Yes. Okay. Can you explain that or do you want me to? Please, why don't you explain it, please? <laughs> okay. The reason is actually, it, it's actually more simple than you. I saw as you were thinking through that, you were thinking too complicated. Go for the obvious in this case. The reason you get security deposit back is that the landlord has breached the lease. Okay. okay. The landlord's entitled to keep the security deposit if the tenant breaches the lease, but this was all predicated. Constructive eviction was predicated on the fact that the landlord breached the lease. Okay. So what do I want you to remember about constructive eviction? It's a definition. The tenant's right to move out based on the landlord's breach. And then those examples I went over with uh, Charles, don't withhold money until it's uh, fixed. Don't repair it yourself and withhold that. Anytime you're in a landlord's property, you owe them their rent, okay? Right. So notice what I said. Anytime you're in the landlord's property, you, withhold, uh, you uh, owe them the rent. If you choose to move out and exercise your right of constructive eviction, you can stop paying rent at that time. Get your security deposit back. To be honest with you, you might actually be entitled to part of your rent back as well because mm -hmm. they were renting it to you at a substandard condition. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. All right. Now, uh, retaliatory eviction statute, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this. It is what it says it is. In North Carolina, there's actually a protection for uh, tenants so that landlords can't just get mad at them and say, hey, I'm evicting you because you complain too much. I'm evicting you because you went to the building inspector. In North Carolina, there are protections against uh, evict evictions for retaliatory purposes. Now, keep in mind, we're, we're in test world here. In real world, you understand you have to prove this, right? But in test world, um, you're being evicted for retaliatory uh, purposes. Um, and now we get to actual eviction. And notice what I did here. Actual eviction and summary ejectment are the same thing for our purposes. Actual eviction, summary ejectment, judicial eviction. For our purposes, they all mean the same thing. It'll just help you read a question. 
this is when the landlord evicts it. It's what you would commonly just simply refer to as an eviction, okay? Now, in regards to an eviction, there's only one way that you're going to get rid of a tenant in North Carolina that uh, you're not happy with. And the only legal way that you're going to do that is through the eviction process. It, there's going to be a court case involved. There's going to be notices that have to be given. Uh, they'll have to be given their opportunity to speak at a uh, trial in front of a magistrate, okay? So the important things I said there is, are the actual eviction is the landlord's right. It will be heard by a civil magistrate. This doesn't have to go before big jug, big robe, and all that type stuff. It's just a magistrate that will uh, handle those. But that's the only way to legally get rid of someone in North Carolina. So the way we twist this into a test question is by asking you uh, this. Self-help evictions, even though it sounds okay, self-help evictions are always illegal. So examples of self-help evictions are you change the doorknobs or you change the uh, keys while they were going to work. You threw their stuff out on the front lawn while they were going to work. You cut off their utilities. All of these seem creative, but they are illegal in North Carolina. Landlord, if you want to get rid of a tenant, you need to go through the eviction process if they will not voluntarily leave. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Closely associated with that is the Tenant Security Deposits Act. Now, I did make a note here. This applies to residential only. This, is, this actually comes under the Residential Rental Agreements Act, so it doesn't apply to commercial properties. And again, relax your mind when we talk about the Tenant Security uh, Deposits Act. I relax your mind in this case is, for the most part, this is somewhat obvious. What is going to be the appropriate use of the security deposit? Security deposits should only be used for the purpose for which they were uh, obtained. In other words, don't, don't take someone's security deposit, pocket that money and go spend it and just not give it back to them unless they have done something that allows you to. So when we talk about when the landlord can keep the, uh, the security deposits, well, the landlord can keep the security deposits for unpaid rent. If a tenant leaves and doesn't pay rent, well, I mean, that's kind of what we collect the security deposit for, right? Damages beyond normal wear and tear. Now, we used to ask this question on the exam, but it was a, it was a softball question, so don't panic on this. Uh, and it had to do with what are, what are considered damages beyond normal wear and tear as opposed to what's normal wear and tear. So, for example, um, if, I have, uh, if my tenant leaves and there's some spots on the wall where they had hung their pictures of their family, well, I can't take the security deposit for that. On the other hand, if they had punched a hole in the wall, clearly I can keep the security deposit uh, for that. If my windows are a little bit dirty when they uh, leave, I get it. Sometimes this happens when people live in uh, houses. If they broke my blinds, well, that's different. Okay. That, so the difference between normal wear and tear and uh, what's, what's acceptable and what's not. If you go back and look in your book in this particular chapter, it will give you on one page. I can't remember what page it is, but it'll give you a list of examples of normal wear and tear versus beyond normal wear and tear. You can keep a security deposit uh, for that. And then you should account to the tenant within 30 days after they move out. Now, when Charles moved out, he left his place immaculate. So I need to account for his money. I have up to 30 days to do it, but the accounting is going to be very simple. I'm simply going to cut him a check for a security deposit and we're done. On the other hand, if there had been damages, I'm still going to cut him the check but it will be itemized and it'll say, you gave me $1,200, you did $300 worth of damage, here's where I spent it, 1,200 minus 300 is 900, here's your check for $900. And I will do that within 30 days. I will account to the tenant within 30 days. There is a 60 day rule out there, but 60 day rule has, uh, has to do with if the place was damaged so much that it took me a long time to figure out what the damages are, then that would be, uh, that I have up to 60 days to return the money in that standpoint. But for the most part, it's 30 days. That's what I, I go by, okay? Um, and uh, on that uh, note, I, should, I said something I want to uh, hit on. Oh, oh, I know what it was. We often test you on this as well. Security deposits should only be used at the end of the tenancy. So notice, for example, a little bit earlier, I said they could be used for unpaid rent. Well, if Charles didn't pay me my February rent, I can't just take that from the security deposit. What it means is if Charles leaves 10 months down the road and he's gone and I'm holding the security, he didn't pay me my last month's rent, I can take it out at the, at the termination of the lease agreement, okay? So when you can use security deposits, occasionally that'll show up on the uh, test. Where can security deposits be held? They need to be held in a trust account.
okay? If you guys are agents and you're holding security deposits, they need to be held in a trust account. The amount of the security deposit, okay, I'm gonna go the easy way on this because I only have a few questions I can ask you, so I'm not gonna get into nitty gritty detail on this. So for those of you who want to study this at a high level, which is probably okay, the, the amount of the security deposit is based on the term of the lease. So for example, if you're renting from me year to year, in other words, we have a 12 month uh, lease. If you're renting year to year, I can collect up to two months of lease uh, of, of what your lease would be as security deposit. So if your lease is $1,000, I could theoretically collect up to $2,000 for security deposit. I can collect less if I choose to, I cannot collect more because there's a maximum amount of security deposit I can get. If it's a month to month lease, technically I could collect a month and a half. If it's week to week, I can collect two weeks, okay? So if you wanna study this on a high level, hey, security, the amount of security deposit is based on the term of the lease. If you wanna get down to the nitty gritty, if it's year to year, two months. If it's month to month, month and a half. If it's a week, up to two weeks. Okay, maximum security deposit. And then pet fees, I love this for a question. And the reason I do is because it, it goes into two chapters, property management and fair housing. Pet fees, you can, as a landlord, you can collect reasonable, and that's what the law says, reasonable pet fees. They don't give you a number, they say reasonable, okay? Um, having said that, you cannot charge a pet fee to someone who has a companion animal. Do you remember that? Under fair housing, do not charge a pet fee to someone who has a companion animal, and this is verifiable, okay? In other words, if someone has a CNI dog, clearly that's companion animal. If someone has a little, uh, uh, I can't remember what they're called, we'll just say, we'll stay with, uh, or like a comfort animal. If they have a comfort animal and their doctor has prescribed that they needed that, then I would have to allow that uh, as well. I can't charge a pet fee for it, and I can't charge them rent if they have a companion animal. But in, as regards, in regards to pets, clearly I can charge a non-refundable pet fee if they are, do not have a protection. I also like this little section right here because it's so easy to learn and it's so predictable. This is literally just vocabulary. Uh, when we talk about lease types, you just need to understand and be able to compare them to each other. So I put the definition on here. I'm gonna walk through it fairly fast. That doesn't mean you can't ask questions on it. So if, you are, if you're confused between a couple of them, just stop me. Most of us, when we rent an apartment, we pay a, what's known as a fixed flat or gross. In other words, these words right here are interchangeable. Uh, when I had my apartment at the beginning of the month, I went down and gave a check to the landlord. It was the same amount every single month. And um, the landlord took care of paying the taxes on the building. They paid, uh, uh, they paid the insurance on the building. Now, obviously, I paid for my own utilities and stuff like uh, that. But the reason it's called a fixed or uh, flat lease is I just pay them a flat amount. They take care of the operations of the uh, building. Okay, very, very simple. Once you cross that line, you actually get into commercial provisions. We don't talk a lot about commercial, but these are just definition. A net lease refers to a situation where the tenant, remember, this is commercial, right? Where the tenant is paying usually some flat amount of rent but they're also paying their, their pro rata share of common expenses. So for example, the office building that we have at uh, Beaver Creek, we have a set rent that we pay every year or every month. But on top of that, there is a budget for the building for common expenses. Common expenses in our uh, um, area include maintenance of the parking lots, it includes the area lights, and it includes the landscape. So what happens is they have a budget for all of this. They take and break it down based on how many square feet you have, and that's how much our share is. Matter of fact, you can see down here at the end, I put TICAM charges. TICAM stands for taxes, insurance, and common area maintenance. So when you talk about a net lease, the tenant's paying not only some flat amount, but they're also paying their share of TICAM charges, common expenses, okay? The reason we call it net is because, heck, if we're paying part of the landlord's expenses, then he's getting closer to his net as opposed to his gross expense on that type of property. The one that I find that they compare most often on the exam is the difference between net and percentage. 
again, to me, these don't seem that comparable, but students historically have confused these two, okay? So when we talk about percentage, what I tell most people to do is let your mind go to retail. Because what happens in a percentage lease, part of your rent is based on your sales, okay? So if you have a restaurant or if you have a retail store and your sales, the higher your sales are, the higher your rent is going to be if it's a percentage lease tied to your uh, sales. Um, it's not uncommon, by the way, for a retail store to have multiple of these uh, leases, uh, provisions in their uh, lease. The percentage provision is tied to their sales. The more you sell, the higher your rent's gonna be, okay? Make sure when you go back, compare net and percentage to each other and make sure you're ready for that. The rest of these you see less often, but we'll go over them anyway, because you have to have four potential answers. A graduated, now keep in mind, in this class, every time I use the word graduated, think stair steps, okay? Think stair steps. In a graduated uh, lease, just like in an adjustable uh, uh, rate, or I'm sorry, not adjustable rate, but a, uh, a graduated lease, just like in a graduated payment plan on a uh, mortgage, every year your uh, lease is going up. I guess theoretically it could go down, but it typically is going to go up. Now, when we're talking about leases, let's make this completely logical to you, and then you probably won't even have to go back and uh, study it. Uh, in a commercial lease, it's very common to have a seven or a 10 year lease. Well, keep in mind the landlord doesn't want the lease to be the same every year. So what they do is they graduate it every year. It's gonna go up by a certain amount. The difference between graduated and index is, graduated, it goes up a set amount every year. So my uh, rate will go from uh, $28 a square foot to $28.50 a square foot next year. Okay, that's graduated. Index just simply means it's still probably going to go up, but it's going to be tied to an index like the consumer price index or something like that. Graduated and an index are technically the same. Graduated just happens to be specific. Index just is subject to a uh, index. Full service lease, I don't think you're going to miss this one on the exam because a full service lease is exactly what it sounds like. It's a lease that provides all services. So for example, a full service lease, well, you can see there, I have the, the most common ones listed, would include janitorial and utilities. So how do I get a full service lease? I just, I end up paying more. And the reason I pay more is because it includes my janitorial and my utilities. Because it includes my utilities, the um, landlord might put limitations on me. They may say, hey, we're gonna be in charge of utilities, but you can't use that property on the weekend because we're gonna have the utilities cut off to save money on weekends. See this a lot in office buildings, okay? Full service, very simple, okay? Ground lease, there's a dead giveaway on ground lease. If you ever get a test question that talks about the lease of land for a period of 50 to 99 years, I promise you they're talking about a ground lease or a land lease. And the reason it's so long is because if someone's leasing land to build a building on it, think about somebody like a Walmart. Walmart would lease land and they're gonna build a building to build their store and they need a period of time to recoup their costs in creation of it. So that's why ground lease and land lease are so long. You lease the land, you build your building on it. That's kind of the way it works. Uh, sell and lease back. So real, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped mineral and oil leases, but they're somewhat obvious. Uh, this is the example that I described to you earlier in the year where um, I found natural gas on my property. I don't know how to drill for natural gas, but what I can do is I can keep the 200 acres where I raise my horses and cattle and stuff, and then I can lease to ExxonMobil the subsurface rights so that they can get the mineral and uh, oil in this case. Um, it has to be in writing because it's a transfer of an appurtenant and transfers of real property are in fact, do have to be in writing under the statute of frauds. So lease pack is, is the one as a uh, long shot. Um, okay, I need to, Nikki, I'm looking at you right now. Can you answer for me real quickly? Sure. Is my internet dragging right now? Mm -mm. Okay, okay. I just got well, a note. I that, as as you, but it did kind of make a, as soon as you said that, it did make like a long. Okay. I don't know. Y'all do me a favor. Like and uh, if it gets too annoying, if you wouldn't mind, just raise your hands and let me know. I just got a note on my computer. It said my internet was unstable. So it may, uh, that may happen from uh, to time. 
it kind of wins like that if it gets to be an issue. Uh, yeah. Sell and lease back simply uh, means exactly what it says. As a matter of fact, let me make it simple for you. The example I gave you there, builders who build model homes, oftentimes, now think about it, a builder who built this model home, builders are in the business of building a home and selling, getting their money back, right? So what they do sometime on a model home is they build it, they make it nicely a point because that's what they're going to use to try to sell buyers on the uh, property. What they'll do is they'll go ahead and sell that property to an investor with the agreement that they're going to lease it back for two or three so that they can use as a uh, model, a sell and lease back. This is very common in uh, model homes. Okay. Uh, literally, those words are just definitional. Hopefully, you'll get one or two of those on the exam. Now, when we get into property management, this has gotten to be a little bit of a sneaky area on the uh, experience that's going on here. One, you're getting more questions than what we're used to on property management. However, I tend to think that they actually are fairly easy. So please listen to what I'm saying here. In regards to property management, you can't just skip it because you're getting a lot of questions. And the questions are only easy if you do uh, study it. I don't have a ton of notes on property management, but my advice to you is to go to that chapter in the book and just read the topic headings. And if they're bold, ask yourself, do I understand what this says? And if you do, you're fine. If not, read that little paragraph and just ask yourself, did I get what I needed out of that? This is one of those chapters I think you can do, be very, very efficient studying. And in the past, it wasn't even worth that. It was only worth one or two points. But now they're asking somewhere between six and eight questions, property uh, management, definitions, and then look at the top headings and make sure you're doing okay. So to start off with a property manager, the first thing I did just in class is I defined I mean property manager. Use it in this class. Property manager is someone who manages the property of others for compensation, which means that you have to be a real estate broker to be able to do it. For others, for compensation involves real property, so you're going to have to be a broker uh, to do it. Um, the other thing that's important about that is a property manager, as an act, agent acting as a property manager, I have and in writing. That's the rule that we've dealt with all along. It's called a property management agreement, but having said that, it has to be in uh, writing and it has to follow the real estate rules, just like our agency agreement uh, do. When we talk about the duties of a uh, property manager, the most important duty of a property manager, and this has actually been the test question at some points in the past, the duty of a property management is to realize the greatest return given the investor's uh, desires or requirements or whatever their plan is. So in other words, Charles is, my, is the owner of property and I work for uh, Charles. Charles will tell me what his plan is and then he'll say, Chris, you go out and realize the greatest return on this property. Now, Charles may have a high-end property, which means I would probably spend more uh, maintenance and upkeep because he's an image, or he could have property. Nothing wrong with that. I may just not spend as much money uh, painting and stuff like that in between. Ten. So what I do is I try to realize the highest return based on what his uh, goals are for the uh, property. That's the do the property. Uh, difference between the property manager and a resident manager, let's keep this fairly simple, straightforward, and get you a, a test point out of it. The property manager, I told you, has to be licensed. Our definition of a property manager require they be licensed. However, if I may lose property management and I have four or 500 properties under management, I can't possibly be at all of them at any given time. So what I do is I hire a resident manager and that resident manager may run one of my 20 or 40 unit properties, okay? Now, a resident manager does not have to be licensed. A resident manager does not have to be licensed if they are a bona fide salaried employee of a property management company. Now here's where this gets important. What can an employee of a property management company do versus what they cannot do? So a person without a license can in fact uh, lease properties on behalf of the uh, property management company. They can fill out the leases, they can uh, collect the rents, they can collect the security deposits, but they do it all in the name of the property management company. Now, let me remind you real quickly where I'm going with this so you can go ahead and cut to the chase. There are 
two things specifically that a licensed employee that's not, I'm sorry, that an unlicensed employee can do. There's two specific things that an unlicensed employee cannot do. That's what I was trying to say. One is an unlicensed employee of a property manager cannot negotiate the terms of a lease. Do y'all remember that? Yeah, they cannot negotiate the terms. They can fill in the blanks, but all they're doing is filling in what the property manager told them to put in there. And they also cannot show properties for sale. So if I'm a large property management company and I do rent, uh, rentals and sales, an unlicensed person can never show a property for uh, sale. That also came up during license law. So you get a twofer on that particular one, okay? So that kind of takes that and that out of the way. Um, how are rents determined? Let me tell you why I put that bullet point. This is one of those things that you, uh, you see a test question every once in a while and you say, let me just make sure that the students understand where they're going with this I question. How are rents uh, determined? Um, well, basically rents are determined by virtue of doing the functional equivalent of a market analysis, okay? So let's see, let's see, where's, uh, oh, Jackie probably can't, uh, she can hear me, but she can't, call, can't uh, respond. Hey, uh, Nikki, can you hear me right now? Unmute yourself. Yeah, I can. Okay. Talk me through this real quick, if you don't mind. Um, I have an apartment building over in North Raleigh. It's two bedroom, two baths. I'm trying to determine, as an owner, I'm trying to determine how much my rents should be on the property. You're my property manager. How can you help me solve that uh, dilemma? How can you help me determine how much the rent should be? I guess do a, like a market analysis. Yeah, how much are other two bedroom, two baths renting for in the uh, area, right? You with mm -hmm. me so far? Okay, you come back to me and you tell me that the number is 808. You're, you're my professional property manager on the uh, site. I live in California, by the way. And so here's what I tell you, Nikki, tell me how you respond to this. Oh, uh, wow, I can't make any money at 880 bucks, Nikki. Um, will you rent those properties for $1,000 a month for me? What's your reply gonna be? I could, but you're not gonna, you're limiting <laughs> yep. the, you know, the options. You're not gonna get as many uh, That's right. renters. I can market it for you at 1,000 bucks but no one's gonna pay a thousand when they could get the same product for 880. So the reason I mentioned that to you, it's actually obvious when you hear it. So Nikki was trying in her mind to figure out what's the trick question uh, on this. <laughs> but on the test, they actually used to have a question that was like this and they would, the, the answers would be something like, well, uh, it could be based on uh, what the um, investors needs are. No, rents are gonna be determined by what the market conditions uh, are not by what my needs are. If that were the case, I could just put any number I wanted to on there. But what Nikki, my professional property manager did was a market analysis. That will determine how much the rents will be. And if I put pressure on uh, Nikki and say, well, you need to rent those for a thousand or 1200 bucks. The fact that it matter, the fact that it matter is if she can't get that amount, she probably needs to dump me because there's no sense in her wasting her time, her money, her marketing efforts, if she can't rent the properties uh, for that. The prices are determined by the market. It's as simple as uh, that, okay? Um, definition of upfitting, another one of those examples of uh, terms that we know come up. Upfitting, I doubt seriously that you guys have had to deal with this unless you have commercial properties, but the definition of upfitting, actually it's there. Modifying a property to meet the tenant's specific needs. Think about, uh, think about commercial though, okay? And so uh, to give you an example, the property that where y'all came to take the uh, class um, last year this time, it was just an old bar, right? So when we leased the property, all we got were the four walls. And then we negotiated with the landlord on how we were going to upfit it to turn it into an office complex. And so by doing that, when, what I mean by we negotiated with the landlord is our rent could be a lot cheaper than what it is. But if it was, we would have had to pay for our own upfit. What we did is we worked with the landlord. The landlord helped us with the upfit and then they just amortized it into our lease. That's another reason we have a seven year lease because it'll take us a while to pay back for the upfitting, okay? Modifying to meet the specific tenant's needs, right? And then um, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about this in uh, class or actually we did it just so long ago. I need you to go back and look at an operating statement. 
Um, go back and look at the operating statement that's in the property management chapter. It's relatively simple. And let me remind you what you're going to be looking at. And we'll talk about this a little bit for a math question. Fortunately, the question is not as hard as what it used to be on the exam. But let me just remind you and relax your brain. We're getting ready to get into math and we're getting ready to get into something really, really hard. But I want you to simplify it. And here's what I mean by that. If I have an apartment complex that I'm going to try to figure out my income, the first thing I'm going to uh, look at is going to be what's my gross potential income. So my gross potential income is how much I could collect if everything was occupied every single day and everybody paid on time. That would be fantastic, but that's not realistic. That's potential, okay? From potential, I would subtract out my vacancy and credit loss. There's always gonna be something empty. Uh, somebody's always gonna write me a bad check. So we figure that usually based on a percentage, maybe 5%, but it's gonna be uncollectible. So gross potential minus vacancy and credit loss tells me my effective gross. Do y'all remember going over this in class? You probably have a chart where we wrote all this down. It's time to revisit that just because we're getting close to the test. Okay, so now I have my effective gross. Effective gross is awesome, but I haven't paid anything yet. So from effective gross, I subtract out expenses. Now, here's where it actually starts getting important for what we're talking about right now. When we're looking at an operating statement, what we're looking at is the performance of the building. We're not looking at the performance of my capital. We're looking at the performance of the building. So from the effective income, we're going to subtract out what does it cost to manage it? What does it cost to maintain it? Uh, what does it cost to pay attorneys and accountants to keep our books and do our evictions and stuff like that? These are all expenses of the building. Now, here's the note that I'm really trying to get to. There are three things that we do not include in the uh, operating statement. And you can see one of them I actually have uh, asterisks beside, which means I've seen it on the uh, test. Um, debt service is not included in the operating statement. Let me remind you why. I described, described the operating statement as just simply being uh, the performance of the building. You know, whether I put down zero dollars or whether Charles pays it all in cash, our operating statement is going to show the same thing because it's not about our return on investment. It's about the expenses and income of the building. Okay. Just as kind of an FYI, if you want to know what the other two things are that are not taken into consideration on the operating uh, statement, depreciation is not considered in the operating statement. Now that's a tax issue. So I mean, it's going to be handled just not in the operating uh, statement. So uh, debt service, uh, um, what did I just say? Depreciation, and then daggone, what's the uh, third one? That's not taken into consideration in the operating statement. I just drew a blank for a, a second. I'll look it up. I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll let you know uh, what that one is. It's not coming automatically to me uh, right now. Oh, I know what it is, capital improvements. Capital improvements are not taken into consideration in the operating statement. Remember, capital improvements are something that's done to increase the value. They're not day-to-day -day, uh, expenses. So the three things that don't show up in an operating statement, the performance of the building, the debt service, the um, capital improvements, and then, uh, on, now I forgot the other one that I said, depreciation, all three of them. Whew, that was harder than it had to be. Okay. Two chapters there. I think they're chapters, I can't remember what they are in the book, but landlord, tenant, property management come back to back in the uh, book. So hit on those and know that they're gonna be good for you know probably somewhere between eight and 12 questions combined, okay? Fair housing. Now fair housing's good for, I don't know, maybe four to six I questions. Some of them I think are easy. Some of them I think are a little bit interpretive. I love it when they ask test questions that blend two chapters. There's no doubt in my mind that two chapters might be property management and fair housing. And what I mean by that in regards to fair housing and property management, how about things like uh, considering uh, who your tenants are, vetting your tenants. Now, things that I can take into consideration when I'm vetting a tenant versus what I cannot take into consideration. So I can take into consideration a tenant's income, right? If they're gonna rent this property, they need to make at least uh, three times what the rent is. I'm charging $1,000, they need to make at least $3,000 a month. That's fine, as long as I do it for everybody. 
I can take into consider, consideration their credit score. You can't rent here unless you have a minimum of 600 credit score by Fair Isaac. You know, I'd have to be very specific about what, what I use to make sure that I'm consistent across the uh, board. All that's fine. Clearly, I cannot take into consideration someone's uh, race, religion, uh, um, family status. I, I can't take that into consideration. Now, I have seen one trick question on this on the exam, but I think it's fairly straightforward. And what I mean by that is when we talk about familial status, a landlord does not have to, to rent a two bedroom home to somebody that has eight people in the family. I mean, that's clearly beyond what would be appropriate for a two bedroom home. Now, having said that, I cannot limit my property to just single professionals or to just married couples without children. Because if it would fit, if it has enough rooms to accommodate kids, I cannot eliminate families with uh, children because that's protected by uh, fair housing. Um, the only thing that uh, you might be able to get around familial status would be if it's a senior housing that has uh, 55 and older or 62 and older. They, they may have an exemption to that. Okay. So now let's get back to fair housing purely. In regards to fair housing, talk about what the prohibitions are. Now you can write a long essay on this or you can think about this uh, logically, but here are the prohibitions. In regards to fair housing, it says, you cannot discriminate on the sale or rental of housing. You cannot discriminate in the advertising or the sale or rental of uh, housing. Okay, can y'all still hear me okay? Nod your head, yes, if I'm not breaking up. Okay. You cannot discriminate in the advertising or the sale or rental of housing. You cannot advertise, uh, you cannot discriminate in the financing of residential uh, properties. And so these are what we mean by the uh, prohibitions. The Fair Housing Act actually prohibits discrimination in any of those areas tied to uh, housing and includes sale or rental, okay? Also remember, there are seven protected classes. It is worth knowing the seven protected classes. The F stands for familial status. And on familial status, you want to make sure that you know exactly what the definition is. What I mean by that is familial status has nothing to do with the coupling of adults. It has everything to do with children under the age of 18 in the home and also pe people that are either pregnant or adopting or um, uh, if they are a guardian of a child as well, they would be protected under this. So familial status has everything to do with having children under the age of 18 in the house as part of the, uh, some sort of family union, okay? Religion, we're not gonna beat you up too badly on uh, that and make you draw distinctions. Uh, sex would be male, uh, female. In other words, this goes back to the, uh, um, this goes back to the days when single women were discriminated against because they didn't have someone else in the household. Uh, handicap, remember handicap is also referred to as disability status. So you might want to make a note of that for test purposes, it may be referred to as disability status. And disability is also an important definition for you. What I mean by that is you need to understand that disability includes uh, one or more limiting conditions that could be either physical or emotional or mental. So um, disability actually covers a large range. I think I told you a story in class about a young lady who came to me and I recognized no disabilities at all whatsoever. But then I later learned that the reason she had a companion animal was because she had a seizure disorder. You would only recognize that if in fact she had a seizure. Uh, same thing could happen in regards to someone that has PTSD. It might not be a visible syndrome, but having said that, they would be protected under disability status if their uh, doctor had, uh, had, had given them uh, uh, guidance for a companion animal, for example. Uh, CO is color, R for race, N for national origin. Those are the seven protected classes. Now, I gave you an example in class, and I'll repeat it again here real quickly. And that example basically went like this. Keep in mind, for test questions, I'm not asking you if what the seller did or uh, landlord did was um, made them a good human or not. What I'm asking you to look at is, did they violate fair housing laws? And here's what I mean by uh, that. Um, you may find it offensive if someone would not lease to a homosexual couple. You may find it offensive if someone wouldn't lease to someone that's in the military. You may find it offensive if someone wouldn't rent to an unmarried couple of any kind. Uh, however, none of that is protected. 
under the fair housing laws. It doesn't make them a good person, but it's not in violation of these laws. These are the only seven protected classes, okay? Um, there are some exemptions to uh, uh, fair housing. I I'm telling you, you really probably need to go back to your notes and take a look at this because it, it, it gets pretty um, specific here. So for example, a for sale or for rent by owner is exempt from this law. Now, let me remind you, here's what I'm actually saying. If someone uses a, uh, a real estate agent, they're never exempt from the fair housing laws. That's probably the easiest way to remember it. If you use an agent at all, you're not exempt. If you are for sale by owner, you're exempt from the fair housing laws, but that doesn't mean you can discriminatorily advertise. So what I mean by that is if I'm for sale by owner and someone walks up to my house and I say, I don't want to sell to you. Well, the fact of the matter is if you didn't advertise that you didn't want anyone from a specific race or religion or whatever, you're probably not going to be in violation of the law. That make you a good person, but you're going to fall into that exempt category. Also, this exemption would not apply if you own greater than three houses. So in other words, if you were a, uh, a landlord that owned 15 houses, you still, even if you did it for sale or for rent by owner, you still couldn't discriminate. So the exemptions are fairly, fairly narrow and well-defined. Go back and take a look at your notes on uh, that. The enforcement, I don't get too bent out of shape about enforcement, but let me remind you, when I was talking about fair housing in class, I suggested to you that there's two laws that you need to be familiar with. There's actually three, but we'll talk about two to start with. There's the federal, Fair Housing Act, and there's the State Fair Housing Act. The federal act is going to be administered by HUD, Housing and Urban Development. Why? Because it's federal, and that's who oversees housing issues at the uh, federal level. At the state level is the North Carolina Human Relations Commission. Why? Because it's the state, and that's who handles it at the state level. Okay. Um, and just to remind you as well of a uh, uh, question that occasionally pops up anytime that there are competing laws and technically they're not competing laws. They're really overlapping laws. Anytime that there is going to be disparity between the two laws, the most restrictive. Elite fair housing and federal fair housing conflict, whichever is most restrictive is going to rule anyway. Okay. Then also in this uh, chapter, we talked about the civil rights act of 1866. Now here's why that's uh, important. Civil Rights Act of 1866 is, it applies to all races, but it only applies to race. In other words, in the Civil Rights Act of 1866, there are not seven protected classes. There is one, and it's race, and it's all races, and it's all walks of life. In other words, it's not specific to real estate. It's all walks of life. The example I gave to you, a uh, commercial property for a, um, uh, for a retail store, I want to put up a retail sporting goods store, and the tenant, uh, I'm sorry, the landlord looks and said, well, I'm not going to rent it to you because I don't think you fit in with this, uh, in this area. You're not the appropriate, uh, uh, you're not the appropriate race, or you're not the appropriate ethnicity, or whatever it is. Chris, I don't think you'll make it here. So he rules me out, okay? Well, the fact is, he hasn't broken a fair housing law because it's not housing, it's commercial but he did violate the Civil Rights Act because he discriminated against me based on my uh, race. So the Civil Rights Act would apply. The Fair Housing would not because it's not housing. And then finally in this chapter, the American with uh, Disabilities Act, fortunately in uh, this case, the American with Disabilities Act, it defines what it is. Now you remember, this has to do with, well, let's go ahead and scroll down to the next page. The purpose of the American with Disabilities Act, this is the most important nugget here is to provide reasonable access to public accommodations. Notice the examples that I give you there. What do I mean by public accommodations? Office buildings, government uh, buildings, movie theaters, banks, restaurants, transportation. All of these things would be considered public accommodations. So what does American with Disabilities Act say? It basically says that you're going to provide reasonable access now, what do we mean by reasonable access or reasonable accommodations? Um, well, you see it all the time. Um, for someone that's in a wheelchair, a ramp to get up on the curbing. For someone who has limited sight, braille on the uh, elevators, wide doors for people that may be in uh, wheelchairs, these type of things. These are what we mean by reasonable uh, accommodations. Now, keep in mind, 
if it goes reasonable, the, the owner of the property is probably not going to be uh, held to it. But if it's a reasonable accommodation and it's fairly simple to uh, uh, accomplish, the American Disabilities Act would apply a requirement. Literally to this point as well, I don't think you'll be tested on that. You might be tested on this. But literally, when people are talking about a uh, service dog under American with Disabilities Act, everywhere a human can go, that, that service dog can go as well. That's part of what the ADA says, okay? Um, I do want to hit on these real quickly, and then I'll go uh, for uh, today. We'll wrap up the, the fair housing section. Uh, this is almost always a question on the exam. Terminology associated with fair housing. Block busting, steering, and uh, redlining. Uh, go back to your books and look at definitions of those just to make sure. And typically, they, they compare block busting and steering. So block busting, remember, was referred to as panic peddling, okay? Where I, as an agent, I, as a real estate agent, go into a neighborhood and say, hey, did you just notice that uh, this family moved in? And typically, historically, it was based on race, religion, also uh, and ethnicity. Are, uh, get hit kind of hard in this well. Did you notice that that blank family, go ahead and sell your house before property values start up? That is block busting. Clearly, that is a violation of uh, fair housing, right? Steering is exactly what, matter of fact, right beside steering, right channeling. They often use the word channeling in regards to uh, steering, and it's exactly what it sounds like taking someone to areas that you want them to see based on the fact that you want them to be around others that are like them. Steering, you are taking, you're channeling, you're steering people to certain neighborhoods where they would like to be around others like themselves. If agents are making those decisions, that is completely a violation of fair housing laws. Redlining, fortunately, is easy to uh, spot. Redlining has to do with finance. And redlining is the act of a bank literally circling an area on the map and saying, we don't make our best loans there. Why? Because of high ethnicity, eraser, et cetera, on that. Historically, that has been the uh, practice. So go back and study those. The, you always get a test question on block busting, redlining. It could be multiple questions or it could just one where they compare those terms to each other. All of them are offensive to the Fair Housing uh, Act. Okay, so we've been going for about uh, another hour together again. We'll start on federal tax implications. Um, I think we probably will finish on uh, Friday. I feel confident we'll finish on Friday and going over uh, this. Uh, do you guys have any needs that I can address by uh, Friday? Good, good, good. How's it going? Welcome to the game, uh, Patty. Did you get a lot from today? Did? Okay, good, good. You gonna be here on Chris. Friday? Chris, yeah, okay. are we gonna? Go ahead, Carl. Are we gonna go through more math Friday? I think what I'm gonna do this weekend, Carly, is I'm gonna give you 20 math questions so that you can have them to work on over the weekend. I'm gonna go back and study uh, with some other instructors and find out what specifically you're being tested on today. And I'm going to okay. give you 20 pertinent questions. That way, that will give you time to do them. And then by next Wednesday and Friday, depending on whether it takes us two hours or four hours, we will go over uh, those. So okay. Here's, okay. here's the theory. I send them to you this weekend. You take three or four days to put them together, and you can ask questions about that specific math type top. Okay. That, that sounds that's good. my strategy on math. Okay. All right. Well, thanks yes. for uh, being here uh, today. That's all we have uh, for uh, today. A couple of uh, hours under our uh, belt and I will see you all on Friday. So just as usual, you'll probably get that on um, Thursday sometime. I'll send you the link. But as far as I know right now, same time, same channel, nine o'clock Friday, we'll go for two, two and a half hours on Friday as well. Okay. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Y'all have a good Bye, rest yeah. of the day. Thank you, you too.